Hey, what's up? Just got back from Vocabs. Good time for a quick update. Haven't posted much in the past six weeks or so. Hexitas asked me if I've been on vacation. No, just been busy, mainly family stuff. There are some ongoing issues of various kinds in my family. Every few years, multiple disasters strike all at once. I would normally keep all of this to myself, but some of you are disturbingly interested in the tragic comedy that is David Wood's life. And you don't want to just wait for the book. But that's cool. I'm happy to talk. Let's back up to July when we left for a week. We drove to St. Louis for the myotubular myopathy conference. It's about a 17-hour drive each way in an RV. Some of you came to see me at the hotel. One of you brought me a giant iced coffee with two espresso shots. Much appreciated. Quick update on the medical stuff. If you're new here, two of my five sons have a rare genetic disease that keeps their muscles from working. The disease is actually mostly curable now, though the cure is not available. Doctors cured it in mice, then they cured it in dogs. They started human trials last year. Looks like all of the data from the human trials is going to be submitted to the FDA next year to get the treatment approved. If all goes well, the treatment could be available in 2021. That's still a long way off. Some kids aren't going to make it. My kids might not make it. But whatever happens, it will be awesome to cure a disease like this. And once you learn how they're curing this disease, it's really, really cool. Doctors reprogram a virus to go into human cells and splice in the correct DNA sequence in order to correct genetic defects. Once they can do that, there are all kinds of diseases they can fix. Exciting times. After we got back from the conference, Marie had to head back to New York for a funeral. One of her friends, who used to be Reed and Paley's teacher, died of Lou Gehrig's disease. After that, Marie's parents took care of Reed and Paley so that we could drive down to West Virginia, where I grew up. My mom was diagnosed with lung cancer at the beginning of 2018. The cancer was apparently all in her lung, and it was a small tumor. So doctors wanted to cut it out before it spread. But they kept postponing her surgery until she finally got sick of waiting and switched hospitals. We drove to West Virginia for her surgery. This was a year and a half after her diagnosis. The tumor was now bigger than an orange. The doctor said they were going to have to remove a lung. Fortunately, the surgery went better than expected. They only had to remove half a lung. So my mom has one and a half functioning lungs. You know what's weird? You'd think that if they're going to remove half a lung, it would be like the bottom half of the lung, but they removed half of the lung long ways. So she has a long, skinny lung on one side, but it works. Um, now they'll be testing her to see if there's any cancer left. They want to start chemo soon, but they're worried that she's too frail for chemo. Kids, don't smoke. It's not worth it. On the positive side, my brother John just learned his lesson and quit smoking. My mom's a recovering heroin addict. We wanted to get her out of that environment in West Virginia, where heroin use has apparently reached epidemic levels. So once she got the drainage tube removed after her surgery, we had my mom move in with us. We had an extra bedroom, which is where Sam or Vocab or Anthony would sleep when they came to record something, but they can take the couch. It's my mom's room now. On a side note, West Virginia is messed up. It wasn't like this when I was growing up. Growing up, I was what's called trailer park trash. I lived with my mom in a West Virginia trailer park. Everywhere you went, there were hillbillies. But back then, hillbillies were just fun. I took my wife to a bona fide West Virginia hillbilly wedding years ago. My brother John was getting married in a field behind a barn. There was a freshly killed pig roasting over a fire. Someone had brought a freshly poached deer as a wedding present. There were seven or eight pit bulls on chains. People started passing around jars of real moonshine. The mother of the bride showed up to the wedding with a black eye. Later, a drunken brawl broke out. The brawl was started by the father of the bride. Wild stuff. 
There was bad stuff, but it wasn't that bad. It was mostly fun stuff, moonshine drinking and butt kicking. Now I go to West Virginia, and if you didn't know where you were, you'd think that you were in an episode of The Walking Dead, because people walk around like zombies now. Heroin, meth. Kids, stay away from West Virginia. Though I suspect that the epidemic is going to spread to every other state as well. Anyway, after my mom's surgery, I picked up Sam Shamoon, Vocab Malone, Adam Coleman, and John McRae. We headed to New York for the Cross-Examined Instructors Academy. When we weren't at the conference, we were doing other cool stuff in New York. We recorded a bunch of footage. I'll post some of that footage sometime soon because there's some good stuff in there. On a related note, some of you who sent me money back in July ended up covering a lot of apologetics training for some people who couldn't have afforded the trip otherwise. It was funny because months ago, I was telling people, yo man, sign up for the Instructors Academy. It'll be awesome. But David, I can't afford it. Don't worry, man. Just sign up. I'll cover it. I had no way of covering it. These things just tend to work out. Then people gave me a bunch of money, problem solved, awesome trip for everyone. Now, before someone says, but I gave that money for your kids. I already bought everything Reed and Paley could possibly need, except for a wheelchair lift. I still have to get that installed. I have an awesome van and I have a folding ramp, but it doesn't work with the power wheelchairs. They're too heavy. So I'm having a lift installed. Other than that, Reed and Paley have everything. So I bought some other stuff. For instance, I've never really bought furniture. I've always taken someone else's used furniture or something someone was getting rid of or something someone didn't need because he was getting locked up. So I'd say to my dad, yo, if you're looking at two years in jail, instead of putting your stuff in storage, can I have some of it? Our bedroom furniture was my wife's bedroom furniture from when she was a kid. It clearly wasn't made for adults. The drawers were too small, but it's what we had. Not anymore. At 43 years old, I bought my first dresser. I bought a giant man's dresser that comes up to here on me. My wife can't even look in the top drawer without standing on a chair. This thing is massive. It can hold all my fresh gear. So anyway, I bought everything I needed and there was still money left over. Uh, can't just sit on a big pile of money like that. I'm building an empire here, an online apologetics empire. I don't just want an Act 17 apologetics channel. I want a network of apologists who can cover every issue that comes up. That's what we're building behind the scenes. All right, so after our trip to New York, my sister-in-law, Brittany, my brother John's wife, was found unconscious and blue. Her sister called an ambulance. By the time Britt got to the hospital, she was brain dead. We all assumed it was because of a drug overdose. She's OD'd before, but they did a blood test at the hospital and she was clean. It was a brain aneurysm. She was 28 years old, brain dead from an aneurysm. They pulled the plug last Thursday and she died immediately. Thursday was also my brother John's birthday. So his birthday is now the anniversary of his wife's death. Here's the rough part now. John and Brittany's son, my nephew, Little John, was born addicted to heroin. My brother John was in jail for drugs and guns and robbery when his son was born. Child Protective Services put my nephew, Little John, into foster care. Brittany spent more than a year getting clean so she could get her son back. She was given supervised custody a month ago, and then she died. My brother John got out of prison two months ago. He still has three months left in a drug program, but a month from now will be the 18 month mark since CPS has had custody of little John and they can technically put him up for adoption before John has a chance to get him back. Everyone in the family is willing to take little John, but CPS seems hell bent on giving him to someone else. I understand not giving custody to me. I'm a convicted felon and a former mental patient. I get that. 
but my cousin Brandy also wants to adopt him, and she's little goody two-shoes. She's the one who would always snitch on me when I did something. CPS won't give little John to her either. So, that's what's going on. We're all trying to keep little John in the family. We'd all like to see John, my brother, get his son back. I know he sounds bad because of the drugs and such, but John was always the good one. I was the cold-blooded psychopath brother. My brother Manny was the hot-headed, flip out and fight 10 people at once brother. John was the nice one. He would only fight if he had to, and even then, he'd hit a guy a couple of times and then stop and ask, have you had enough yet? So John was always the nice one. He got into drugs in his 20s and then took a bad turn. He's clean now and his wife just died. So John's at one of the most important crossroads in his life. He can either sink into a depression and turn back to drugs, or he can be a man and step up for his son. I think he'll step up. Again, he's the good one. Kids, don't do drugs. Here's what sucks and terrifies me about drugs. If you get addicted to something like meth or heroin, and then you somehow get clean, it's almost like you have to be perfect after that. Because you can be clean for six months or a year or two years, and then all of a sudden you have a really bad day and you hit the needle or the pipe just once for old time's sake, and then you're right back where you started. Best way to win that game is never to play. So these are the ongoing adventures of my family. Right now, we're focused on the rescue of little John and the redemption of his father. Sometimes it almost seems hopeless, but I've realized that I kind of like hopeless situations. Hopeless situations can be awesome. Think about it. My nephew, little John, was born an addict. His grandfather, my brother John's father, we had different fathers, John's father was the baddest dude I have ever met. I spent years in prison with murderers, and my brother John's dad was the baddest dude I ever met. Six foot three, 300 pounds, ex-linebacker, ex-professional boxer, violent dude. He would fight entire bars full of people. He died on his way to kill my mom. Police cornered him on a bridge. He told police what he thought of them, and he jumped off. That's little John's grandfather on his father's side. The man died on his way to kill little John's grandmother, my mom. Little John's grandmother, my mom, is recovering from heroin addiction and lung cancer. I don't know anything about his grandparents on his mother's side, except that his grandmother showed up to his mother's wedding with a black eye and his grandfather started a drunken brawl at said wedding. Little John's dad was in jail when he was born. His mother couldn't have custody because she was an addict. He got to be with his mother for one month before she died. And now he might get to be with his father in a few months. His father will be fresh out of prison and a drug program trying to take care of a baby who doesn't want to smile. Sounds pretty bad. But what makes it bad is also what makes it awesome. If little John comes out of all that dysfunction and achieves anything in life, that's awesome. If my brother John steps up and disrupts the pattern that he was born into and becomes a good father, that's awesome. There are sins that are called generational sins. Parents pass them on to their kids, generation after generation. Those patterns have to be smashed to pieces, and it's a glorious sight to see. So, we all want to help John and little John get through this situation. We'll have a better idea what CPS is going to do in the next month or so. If things aren't looking good, I'm going to get John a lawyer. Britt's funeral is this Saturday. It'll be a classic hillbilly funeral out in the woods. I won't be able to make it because I'll be speaking in Texas, just outside Houston. 
but Maria's driving down with my mom and Luke and Blaze and Kepler. Little John is going to be at the funeral, so Marie and my kids will finally be able to meet him. All of this makes you sit back and think. Apparently, you can just drop dead from a brain aneurysm one day. I could drop dead from a brain aneurysm tonight. Tomorrow is not guaranteed. So we have to think about what's important, what's going to last. I've been making videos about Muhammad for years now, and it's time for me to apologize to Muslims everywhere. I've focused so much on Muhammad because millions upon millions of people have been manipulated into thinking that they should base their lives on his teachings. Some have even been manipulated into thinking that the greatest thing they can do in life is to die while killing others for Allah. Someone has to confront Muhammad and his teachings. But who in the world am I? I come from a massively dysfunctional background. My dad was a drug dealer and an alcoholic. He died with his head in a garbage can. My mom was a drug addict. Now she's battling cancer. I've been to multiple jails, multiple prisons, multiple mental hospitals. My brothers are in drug programs. My sister-in-law just died from an aneurysm. I have two disabled sons who have endless medical problems. I'm surrounded by family catastrophes. The world is falling apart all around me. And every time disaster strikes, when the dust finally settles, I'm left standing there thinking, wow, none of this hurts me at all. I must be indestructible. And if I'm indestructible, if I can take anything this world can hurl at me, then I have to believe that I'm this way for a reason, because I believe in a God who is sovereign. I mentioned earlier that I like hopeless situations. What could be more hopeless than the rapid spread of an ideology that calls for the violent subjugation of the entire world? Let's make it even more hopeless. If you dare criticize or question this ideology, you're labeled a racist and a bigot by politicians and journalists and educators and entertainers, and you and your entire family will be threatened with torture and death. Utterly hopeless. I feel like I'm made for this. I keep getting sidetracked by family disasters, but once the disasters are over, I feel more powerful, more focused, more invincible, like I should fling myself relentlessly at the biggest, most hopeless situation in the world and see which one of us breaks first. Muhammad was a madman. Sometimes it takes a madman to deal with a madman. The world needs a madman. I am that madman. So, I have to apologize to Muslims everywhere for not taking my calling seriously enough, for not coming at your prophet hard enough, for not working diligently enough to rescue you from the deception you've been manipulated into accepting. I hereby vow to get back on track. But I think it will take a couple of weeks. I'll probably post Muhammad Meets Stephen W. Hawking tomorrow. I know I was supposed to post Muhammad Meets Darth Vader last week, but I needed some outside help with some special effects. Fine, I'll give you a quick sneak peek. Some people believe my special sword is the same one Isa will use when he returns to kill all the pigs and the Antichrist. It's called the Sword of the Prophets. Counterfeit religion and ancient weapons are no match for a good lightsaber at your side. Really? Well, my religion is now the ultimate power in the universe. Allah commands I use it. Don't be too proud of this suicide vest you've constructed. The ability to blow up a boom boom room is insignificant next to the power of the force. 
See, I didn't know how to do that. Then my special effects guy said I should sit on this video until a new Star Wars trailer drops and everyone is interested in Star Wars, so that's what I'm going to do. But I'll probably post another episode of Muhammad's Boom Boom Room tomorrow. Then I'm heading to Texas. I'll be speaking this Saturday morning, Saturday evening, and Sunday morning at International Bible Church in Stafford, Texas, just outside of Houston. The link is in the description box, in case you're in the area. I'll start to get back to classic D. Wood in front of the bookshelf videos next week. Then I'll be with Jay Smith and Eddie Delcor at the Our Strong Tower Conference in California. The link for that is also in the description box. Then my summer travel is over, and the latest wave of family catastrophes will be coming to an end. And when I get back, my Muslim friends, your profit is mine.